Welcome to the Music Journal Podcast, where we talk about the hottest things happening in music right now, and also how you can apply it if you're an aspiring producer or musician yourself. I'm your host, Wes Yi. I'm a producer, artist, and educator, and I'm stoked to be chatting with you. Let's make history. All right, welcome to another episode of the Music Journal Podcast. Today we have a really amazing guest. His name is David Campos, and he's pretty much just an all-around incredible guy. Um, By total coincidence, we have a pretty similar musical background. We both started our musical journey on the piano at a really young age, and uh, we've both done jingles as well, but his work can be heard internationally. Um, He's sold 1.5 million records. He's won many awards for his work. And he's the founder of an online music production school called Advanced Music Production, where he teaches you everything a music college would at a fraction of the price. And we in America know how expensive college can be. So I'm really excited to have you on the show, David. Pleasure to be here. Dude, you're the man. Um, I gave a really brief synopsis as to what you do and, and all the cool things that you're doing. Do you want to just kind of fill in some of the gaps and, uh, and let everyone know a little more? Would you like to know about my musical journey? I want to definitely know about your musical journey because I know you started really young and uh, mm. and you, you were kind of a professional at around 12 or 16 or somewhere in that ballpark. Well, I think my, my love for music started when uh, I started just messing around on the piano at, at the age of five. And then uh, what actually got me to love, love pop music was my dad used to force me to record all the music videos on VHS. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> I do. I'm not that it was before yet. MTV. So we used to make our own MTV by recording all the videos on, on tape. And that forced me to, you know, learn and get to love pop music. And then um, by 12, I was singing on jingles. And uh, by 16, I was programming music on a Atari 1040 ST on Notator, which was the forerunner mm-hmm. of Logic yes. Pro. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. we had a two megabyte sampler, which we thought was pretty awesome at the time. And uh, yeah, I've been in the business uh, doing jingles, music for film, uh, producing albums, and then finally got into teaching, teaching online. And I'm proud to say we built a nice big community of like-minded music producers, programmers, recording composers, etc. And uh, I'm loving it. I think one of the coolest things about your career is the evolution that you've seen. So you're mentioning all this crazy gear that... Uh, it's totally before my time. And then in addition to that, I think your whole uh, like kind of anti-college mantra is really profound to have at the age of 12, 16 years old. How were you able to kind of make that transition from going to school to, uh, to not? Did it just kind of fall in your lap or uh, obviously you had to hustle and grind, but um, what was that like? Well, I, I grew up in a musical family. Uh, my dad was a, a session guitarist. Mm. and uh he 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 wanted to get into production so at you know at the time i was i was like sitting there with my dad and i convinced him to buy a notator and a, a an atari and and then we started programming in the lounge and then my dad started to make it uh you know in producing demos and stuff like that and then i was there always by his side And uh, eventually I was working so much with my dad that I was trying to pass school. I mean, I couldn't, you know, I was getting like six hours sleep and I hadn't done my homework and the teachers were screaming at me. And the next thing you know, I'm sitting in a meeting with like the creative director of the marketing department of Coca-Cola. And then the next thing, you know, I've got a a teacher shouting at me because I haven't done my homework. And I just said to myself, oh, screw that. I think school sucks. I'm going to do music. Priorities, right? Yeah. Were your parents pretty supportive of it? Yeah, yeah. My dad, uh, my dad loved music, and you know, he he was happy that I, I chose music as my career. Uh, unfortunately, I got three kids, and none of them have chosen music. So, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> uh, I wish I had one of my kids at least had chosen it. Look, I got a twelve-year-old. There's still hope. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's never too late. Um, I find that a lot of people. I'm 24 years old. And uh, yeah. it's funny because we, we have pretty different backgrounds, I guess, as far as um, our, our upbringing. But my parents were totally against me pursuing music as a career. 
Um, and they, they ironically started me on piano when I was six years old. Uh, it, was, it was partially a cultural thing. But what I found is at 24 years old, a lot of my friends who also started when they were really young, but somewhere down the line decided to quit and their parents allowed them to quit. Um, now that they're a little older, they're finding that they really wish that they had stuck with it for that whole time. So maybe your yeah. kids will, when they're my age, um, take it back up again. Yeah, you never know. Look, I also believe that music talent is, it's not just about playing, it's, it's about listening, you know? So totally. one thing my dad always did is he forced me to listen to, I mean, I say forced, I was a willing uh, participant is, you know, he made me listen to classics like, uh, you know, R and B and soul and blues, mm. you know, blues rock from the seventies, you know, Stevie Wonder. Yeah. That's rock fusion. The, you know, the Beatles, you know, sort of classic, uh, uh, hits and, and music genres from the fifties all the way up. And, and I've done the same with my kids, you know, um, even, even make forcing them to listen to MC Hammer and Vanilla Ice and stuff from the <laughs> 90s. And of course, the great stuff like Tupac and Notorious B.I.G. What do they uh, like? They actually, they love all music from, like okay. I said, 50 right up to now. So we, we listen to everything. I wouldn't be surprised if they ended up getting into it at some point in their life. <laughs> There's always hope, eh? I feel like, um, well, I can't speak for everybody, obviously, but... Uh, I live in an apartment and my downstairs neighbor, her dad was the original drummer of Boston, the rock band. And Ooh. she's like the biggest stickler about music. Cause I, everybody who lives in this apartment with me, we're all musicians. Um, so she's like super strict about the cap, which is fine. Like I, I'm totally down to respect my neighbor and everything. Yeah. But uh, I, I have a feeling that because her dad was a drummer and she kind of grew up immersed in music, um, mm. that, that kind of plays into why she kind of hates it so much. So it's kind of interesting to go either way because you also grew up in a musical family, but yeah. you kind of took off running with it. Well, I think, I think for me, my, the way I rebelled was, uh, my dad played guitar, so I played piano, you know? Oh, okay. And, uh, and uh, also I think that maybe because the electronic, uh, sort of tools started to come about and I, I love computers. So I felt like, I think that my main instrument, I would say, is mm. the is the door. It's the digital audio workstation. So I'm not the best, um, I'm not the best uh, uh, keyboard player or, or pianist. But, you know, really, to me, making music on a computer is, that is, that is my, my talent, you know. So I, I suppose my dad was more old school. Yeah. You know, what, uh, what are, what's, I, your, what's your take on the direction the music industry has taken and um, just the sound of today. Cause you have a lot of old people. I feel like are kind of like uh, the older generation is very against using the computer as an instrument and using the DAW. Um, but I'm totally for it. And it sounds like you are too. I, I am. Let me put it this way. I believe that music also works in cycles. It's like a pendulum. So, uh, you know, music gets very cheesy for a while and then get, people get tired of that and then it swings back to more, you know, deeper, more uh, creative music. Right. So, I mean, even right now, if we speak of door, I mean, what, what music is not made on a door? I mean, is Sam Smith cheesy? Is it, is it, or is it deep music? I, I would say that that's just as good as any music made in the 60s or 70s, if not better. Totally. But it's all recorded on a door. And are you telling me that his vocals are not tuned? I'm sure they are. They absolutely, so, are absolutely. And they haven't edited and comped and, and perfected those takes. Of course they have. So, I mean, is, is Michael Bublé not recorded on a door? You know, I know for a fact. That nobody works the old way anyway. No, so I think it's just the mindset, you know. Really, to me, especially being a jingle writer, I don't see any real difference between one style and another. It's just different selection of sounds different, uh, maybe slightly different chord structures, you know, maybe different uh, tempos and different, uh, yeah. But, but I also think there's a lot of innovation, musical innovation in modern music. I mean, if you look at trap music, they brought uh, uh, triplets into the beat. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't have triplets in, in, modern, in pop music for like 50 years. Yeah, isn't that you know? strange? Yes. I mean, jazz had triplets and then nothing for 50 years and boom, right. it's back again. And, and like for me, that's, that's like to all the old guys out there, you know, you know, you, have you actually analyzed the modern music to see that there is innovation there? So maybe, maybe the guys don't rap as well as uh, Notorious B.I.G. did. Definitely you know, not. Or, or <laughs> but, uh, 
But, um, you know, they're doing other things in a different way. And I think that every generation has to put their stamp on uh, their music and their art. And I think that the tools of the day are computers. And I I'm 100% for that. I, I don't look down on that at one bit. I agree 100%. Um, my take on the whole uh, rapping thing, too, like they're not doing it as well as some of the 90s guys. Um, mm. If somebody wants to listen to it, then I can't hate on it. You know what I mean? Um, somebody somewhere is going to like it. And who am I to say that they shouldn't like it just because I don't. Um, and I do exactly. too. That's the other thing, uh, it's kind of funny. We kind of just totally insulted all these old people because a, we called them old and <laughs> B, we just totally dissected their way of thinking. Um, but yeah. I, I totally, totally back everything you said. Um, I think what's also cool about having the computer, um, mm. such a, such a important role in making music today is the fact Ooh. that anybody can be a producer now. Like you don't have to have started on one instrument when you were six and then learn another one and learn another one or know somebody who's an amazing saxophone player and then schedule a, a session for them to come in. Um, exactly. Everybody can do it. It's, it's so much more convenient. Yeah. It's, it's quite exciting actually. I think that what it's done is actually going to open up music. And now the way the industry is turning around, you know, independent musicians are, are getting more power every single day through the internet. Yeah, and sure. I think that we're going to have already. It's happening. There's a proliferation of music. There's so much music in the world today, ten thousand times more than there was in the '90s and the in the mm. '80s, because the the industry was so narrow. You you needed millions of dollars to get those multi-track and massive consoles, and uh, you know those old systems. And then very few artists got signed. Very few mm. artists got played on radio. And today, I mean, just YouTube. You go to YouTube, and there's just you couldn't find all the artists if you tried. Right. Yeah. True. Um, do you feel like the market's oversaturated or do you think it's at a good place? I don't think that there is such a thing as oversaturated. I think that oh, interesting. people, people, you know, the 7 billion people mm. and uh, if you can get 0.0000001% of that and that's your tribe, that's your audience, those people resonate with you, then, then that's it. What's wrong with that? Yeah, beautifully said. So to the listeners who might think that there's too much um, too much out there to consume, it's definitely not true. You just have to find your audience for you. Um, David, do you have a crazy story from just any part of your career that you'd like to share? Oh. <laughs> what, what kind of crazy you want? <laughs> well, uh, you don't have to censor yourself on this show. So literally whatever you want, I guess. Um, let me think. Uh, I've had so many things. I mean, let me think. Uh, one of the fun, one of the funniest stories is uh, I was I was with this um, I was recording this uh, rapper here in South Africa, quite a big uh, artist. He sold double platinum here. And uh, what's his name? Mapaputsi. Okay. And, and uh, this guy, he. Um, he was he he had he had his boys like uh, backing him in the chorus, so they they were doing doubles over his uh, his rap in the chorus. And uh, I said to the guy, "Listen, the take was good, but I think I think you need to put a bit more energy in." So then he like pops in, you know, from the control room, and he says to his friend, "He's like, yes, man, you need to you need to have more confidence. You need to be confidential." <laughs> <laughs> I, re I remember thinking, oh, that's the wrong use of the word confidential. <laughs> yeah, we did. We got, got the we got the take, and it and was very cool. You know what his friend meant too. I think I think they both spoke the same language. <laughs> what if they actually meant they didn't want to release the song? They wanted to just keep it totally <laughs> confidential. Well, well, the story is definitely not confidential anymore. <laughs> totally. What's the name of the song? Oh, I don't remember now offhand. Oh, uh, okay, no worries. Sorry. Yeah, it's all good. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe you have a South African accent. Oh, why? Yeah. What do you think I sound like? I would guess Australian. Yeah, there's, there's some similarities, but from our perspective, we think Australians sound very different to us. Uh, and I'm sure they think My we bad. sound different to them. Yeah, but I think that's an American thing. I think Americans... You see, we, we're exposed to your accent a lot, mm. um, but you're not exposed to ours that much. Right. So probably, totally you, know, you haven't tuned your ear to our accent. 
Um, I would say accents aside, that's kind of kind of true just in general with America. We kind of shut ourselves out from um, a lot of the world. Uh, like everybody else speaks English, but we don't speak any other languages. Um, it's, yeah. it's a little wild. Where are you from, though? I'm from South Africa. Oh, you are from South Africa. Yeah. Oh, really? So you do have a South African accent. Yes, I do. Oh, that's what it sounds like. Yes. Well, oh. I've got a, I've got what's a Northern Johannesburg, uh, white English accent. That's, okay. That's my accent. Yeah. So we can tell. I can tell someone from the south of the city and I can tell someone from a different city. I'm sure you got the same thing in the States. Every city has its own accent. I wouldn't say every city does, but um, different regions do for sure. So uh, I'm from the East Coast. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. But everybody right. says I have like a California accent. Like good friends of mine who I've known for years think I'm from California. And I ran into my landlord the other day. Uh, I like got out of my car and she's waiting at the front door of my building. I guess she was going to inspect something and, uh, and I'm walking up and Lisa turns to me and just, she, she just goes, she goes, Oh, it's West from California. And I didn't bother correcting her. I was like, yep, fuck it. I'm from California. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I was so. gonna, I wasn't sure if you were from the East coast or California because I was trying to place your accent to me. You oh, seem really? to have like, like you said, Boston, but then you go, yeah, you're like laid back. <laughs> I'm also like half asleep still though. So maybe that's okay. <laughs> um, David, what's uh what's something somebody wouldn't guess just by looking at you? Like first, first impression. Uh, a lot of people don't realize how old I actually am. I'm 43 years old. I was uh, going to ask that too. Cause you mentioned three kids yeah. and I was like, wait yeah. a second. But people usually think I'm in my thirties and uh, I've got three kids. I got married very young. I was married. Mm. At 21 with my first kid. Oh, wow. And I uh, started my business, uh, music production company then. And yeah. I, I basically, I think what catapulted me into doing it was, was I had to make money to, to feed my babies, my children and my wife. So uh, I, I was a family man from very young and I've been married now 21 years, my, 22 years. My daughter's 21, my son's 19 and my last born is 12. Mm. Congratulations on such a long marriage. Um, it's crazy like, how your your killer instinct just kind of kicks in when you need to do something. Yeah. Um, like if you need to feed your family and fend for them and everything, it's it's crazy the, how that just happens. I, I think like, you know, if I was a single guy, I could just sleep with my friends on my friend's couch. <laughs> <laughs> you right. know, just picking totally up bucks to that. Buy some cheeseburgers and put petrol in in my beat up old car. And I mean, you know, <laughs> kids, it's like no ways. I gotta make money. I gotta yeah, do yeah. quick. I gotta get professional. You know, I gotta like. So I think that helped me. And also, like, I bought I bought into property and housing when I was very young. And uh, oh, smart. To, so it was all really. I kind of fast forwarded my. But then I did also drop out of school when I was young, sixteen. Mm. I think I was always a little bit ahead of my time. Right. That's awesome. Um, yeah, because I was going to say, it's a really profound realization to have at 16, I feel like, to realize that school isn't for you when everybody else you know is going to school. Was it, was it difficult to kind of make that transition? Yeah, you know, I, I did well at school. I, I remember I got, we were doing like trigonometry in grade 11. I got 98% for the exam. And then I went to the teacher and I said, uh, sorry, ma'am, we're gonna. I'm I'm dropping out of school, and her eyes almost popped out of her head. <laughs> she said, "No ways!" Like I was one of the top math students, and uh, but I just, you know, I just didn't have a passion for for school. I, I couldn't. I didn't get a okay. All the other subjects I was failing, but mathematics I was doing well. <laughs> but uh, and yeah, I think um, I don't know. I, I suppose it wasn't a, a rational decision. It was just a. I was just going with my gut, and uh, I was. I was lucky that my parents allowed me to, but to be honest, uh, uh, you know, I suppose it wasn't very responsible of them to let me do that, but it worked out in the end. <laughs> but it worked out. So, I mean, you could, that's the thing. It's, it's all based on the result, right? So if it didn't work out, then yeah. they'd probably say the opposite, but uh, no, I'm totally on the side that if school's not for you, um, cause, cause that's the thing, like school is one thing, right? It can't, there's no way it can be for everybody. I, it's just impossible. Yeah. It makes sense for everybody um to have some some predetermined destiny where they go to school and things work out better for them 
So I think it totally makes sense to not do it, especially if you realize really young and really early that that's not the path for you. Um, mm. What kinds of things were you doing like right after dropping out? Because I know a lot of kids who dropped out and I can tell you for sure right now they weren't buying real estate or fucking starting businesses or anything like that. Uh, I was I was cutting up drum loops on the on, on the sampler. That's what I was doing, <laughs> and I was trying to reverse engineer, you know, Dolly Parton tracks and stuff like that. Mm. that that's what I was doing. Um, yeah. Would you say that you had like a quote unquote big break, or do you think it's just been a series of really small wins? Yeah, it's. Uh, it 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 has it has been it's been a, a series of, of big breaks um, and a lot of hard work in between. You know, I think the more hard work you put in, the more uh, you you have a fertile ground for opportunities to come your way and that you're ready to to take them on. You know, yeah. So I mean, when I when I finally went and started my own company at 21 and I was trying to fend for my family, um. I had put in at least five years of really working hard at programming and producing music that I had the skills. Uh, and I went around to all the film production companies, advertising agencies, and like most of them said no. Mm -hmm. But there was this one guy who said, um, they were doing this commercial for Uno, Uno Fiat, you know, Fiat Uno, the car. And uh, they already had two jingle writers doing the music they were pitching and they said, look, we, we've got two guys. You could be the third, but we're not going to pay you for your pitch. But if you win, then we'll pay you. And I was like, okay, cool. And uh, I managed to hustle a, a track together. I had hardly any gear and uh, I, I beat the other two guys. And those guys had like, those are the days they literally had tape. I mean, they had like multi-track, you know, tape and uh, consoles and all that crap, like million dollar studios. And I had a, a little sampler and a, and a PC with a cracked version of Logic, you know, <laughs> on my PC. And, uh, and I beat them. And the next thing you know, the, the, the lady said to me, okay, uh, you, can you send us an invoice? I didn't know what an invoice was. I had to oh, go and wow. ask, what's an invoice? Like, <laughs> and they showed me how to make an invoice. And uh, she said, how much are you going to charge? I said, I don't know. And then she just told me her budget. And uh, the next thing you know, it was, it was quite a lot of money. It was like, Two thousand dollars. I mean, for me at that stage, that was a lot of money. Yeah. And I took the money and went and bought more gear. And uh, I've had a few nice. moments like that in my career where, yeah, you know, combination of hard work and also lucky breaks. Yeah, it's funny. I get a lot of emails from people who uh, who ask me like, "Oh, is is it all just based on luck? Like, how do you do it?" Um, I heard a great quote recently that said, "Luck is where preparation meets opportunity," which awesome. I couldn't agree with more um that's the other thing about it too man like people see the final result but often ignore everything that went in behind it like i've worked on spec too like i've done the exact same thing um and it's it's the people who put in all those hours who ultimately find success um, yeah yeah it's unfortunately almost our time but i have one question i ask on every episode and i'm curious what your answer to it is going to be so if you had unlimited money no strings attached what would you do and why unlimited money what unlimited it's a good question um i carry on doing what i'm doing now i awesome. think uh i love I love what I do. You know, now what I'm doing at the moment is I, I'm, I'm empowering the future generation of music producers and, and, and song creators. And um, I just love seeing the success of my students. And um, uh, I also do private coaching and I love that. I find I'm, I'm excited to see other people's success now. And I'm also excited to see the old system die. You know, I want to yeah. see those majors go down in flames. And wow. uh, I want to see the new guys rise up and uh t you know do it in a new way and and i'm excited about the future so for me i've always been passionate about music since i was five and i will carry on doing music until i die you know mm -hmm. everything else is just a means to an end like internet marketing and websites and spotify and all these things that we have to do it, it's 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 all about music for me at the end of the day yeah that's a great way to look at it, um, a means to an end. Because I know people who, I was literally talking to my friend the other day and he was saying like, yeah, like I love making music, 
but I hate sales. I hate marketing. Um, and I, I feel like that's kind of the difference between a hobbyist and a professional. So I think the way you worded it was beautiful. Um, <laughs> I can't believe you said all that shit about uh, everybody going down in flames. That's <laughs> mad. <laughs> Hopefully they don't hear this. I love these guys. I know these guys are my friends. It's, it's like they fucked with me on Facebook because, you know, like one of my friends is the CEO of uh, Sony here in South Africa. And I, I said something on Facebook about the majors are going to go down in flames or something like that. And he was like offended. And I said to him, <laughs> it's not personal. It's not personal. You know, it's, it's time for, you know, all those decades that the, 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 the artists were taken advantage of. They didn't own their masters and they got such a small share of the money and, you know, there was so much corruption and unfairness yeah, in the right. way the system worked. And like, uh, how can you not be happy that that's dying? You know, how can you not be happy that I believe I call it the democratization of music. That's what the internet is bringing. <laughs> and that for me, you know, yeah, right. I, I'm speaking on a philosophical level, you know, we, we well, it's good. It's not a bad thing. We can't, we, we must have fought it. Like, okay. So shame. I, I feel sorry for people who lose their jobs. I'm sorry that those major corporations are, are you know, dying, but you know, they're making a way for a better future for us, uh, for music. And music is always going to be there. We need music. Music is the soundtrack to our lives. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm all for progress and going forward with a better system. Hey, preach. Um, David, if you want to let the listeners know where they can find you, feel free to plug. Yeah, sure. In. You can uh, check out my website, advancedmusicproduction.com. Awesome. And that link will be in the show notes. David, thank you so much for joining me on The Music Journal. Pleasure, Wes. Anytime, bro. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Music Journal. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you got a lot out of it. If you want to know more about me and what I do, I just put out a personal EP on Spotify. You can go to bit.ly slash Spotify. And if you want to know more about music production, I teach an online course about it too. Just shoot an email to wes at homestudiohits.com and I'll send you an application. Just for filling out the application, I'll send you a free sample pack of sounds I use to make the instrumental you're listening to and more. All these links will be available in the show notes so you can check them out there. And while you're there, if you feel inclined to rate this show five stars, that would really help me out. Other than that, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Thanks again. Peace.